This is a sample chapter from Fitton Books. The Club Max Murder, Chapter 18 A cold drizzle swept off the ocean near the Crosstown Bridge. Jones's apprehension peaked once they reached the Prince William side. He needed to ditch Daniels and Travis before he met with Coco. Daniels drove the Edsel slowly through the back streets and past the St. Bart's Stone Tower before he turned onto Atlantic Avenue. In the next few minutes, it'd be on East Crescent Street. But Jones was a little ambivalent. Questioning Coco was like throwing dirt at a rattlesnake. Only a few lights remained lit inside of Rizzo's supermarket. He checked his watch, 11 o'clock. Saturday night in America, said Travis. Travis, you know you really don't need to be going into this section of town with me. Matthias, I've lived an insulated life. Getting into the real world is uh, invigorating. Don't say I didn't warn you. Honestly, Jones, said Daniel, scanning the tenements, you're acting like a sissy. Oh, and you're such a hero, Daniels. You know, you're really starting to get on my nerves. Starting to? Jones, it's important to sift through the obvious and discover the hidden aspects of life are all around us. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Daniel said nothing, but evidenced a slight smile, as if he relished being compared with Holmes. At the lights, Jones directed him on to East Crescent Street. He signaled and coasted across the street from a three-decker. I'll give you this, Daniels. You have an uncanny ability to remember details. I will take that as a compliment, Jones. Jones, sitting on the outside, opened the door and stepped onto the street. Daniels turned toward Jones. This car was manufactured when cars were cars. Well, I'm going this one alone. Here? asked Daniels in this rat-infested hellhole. Well, I'll second that. I have a lead from Bosco about this guy, Al, lied Jones. Daniels, I'll pay for your gas. Drive Professor Thayer back to Hamilton. The game is afoot. Holmes, adventure of the Abbey Grange. Wonderful. Travis, I'll call you later when I track down this friend of Al's. Matthias, this is a stupid move. I second that remark. Travis, I'll call you. Jones quickly veered into a side alley. The street at the end of the alley was deserted, but residual bass music trickled out the open windows of a three-decker ahead. He climbed a set of unpainted angled stairs and stood on the half-lighted porch. He turned to knock. The wooden storm door's top hinge squeaked open. A little man, slightly bald with frizzy black hair, blocked the doorway. His smoldering cigarette was pinched between his teeth. He looked Jones over before he spoke. Yeah. I'm... I know who you are. A huge man with sandy blonde hair, tied straight back, stepped under the porch. Jones studied a bold blue tattoo on his upper right arm. Wrath. He motioned Jones inside with his head. They quickly climbed the stairs to the second floor. Wrath opened the upper closet where Coco had led Jones into a hidden passageway. The floor suddenly moved upward and Jones was directed down the stairs. The panel closed and Wrath remained behind. Jones slowly moved down the darkened passageway. He heard someone approaching in the dark. Within a second, two large hands frisked him for weapons. A butane lighter's flame flared in the darkness, revealing Coco's long peppered hair, single cross earring, and black eyes. Welcome to Stalag 13, Jonesy. You're in big trouble, Coco. I'll be the judge of that. Now follow me. Holding the lighter flame, he marched into the side room and motioned Jones into a lighted tunnel. The tunnel continued straight for several hundred feet. Jones heard cars passing on the street above. Coco brought him down a small stairway to a large room with adjoining bedrooms and a kitchenette. Ahead was a widescreen TV and the local news. More monitors showed his Crescent Street apartment in the outside area. This is unbelievable. Now, this is the lounge, Jonesy. Why are you hiding out? asked Jones. Joe Sabota, I know about Sabota, and I'm working on it. You're working on it. Pipe down, will you? No. Do you know where they stuck Joe Sabota? Yeah, I know where he is. Now sit down, Jonesy. The implication here is that I took out Gina Quintel. Yeah, that's one of the implications. Forget about implications. I didn't knock her off, and I didn't order her to be knocked off. Jones took a deep breath. Then who did? I ain't got a clue. Yeah, right. His eyes tightened, and he walked right up to Jones. I'm telling you, I don't know, Jonesy. There's other stuff going on here. Then Al did it. 
said Jones. Hey, let me give you some advice. Just stay out of this. You live in another world from what goes on here in the real world. Sabota was lured in. Coco shook his head. Jonesy, the kid was wild for Gina. That's all I know. She worked for you? Yeah, she worked for me. But did you pay her to be with Joe? No. And I'm telling you, you're putting yourself at risk here. I don't want to see you get hurt. Coco, that kid will be found guilty. Coco lit a cigarette with the butane lighter. You know, Jonesy, I trust you. Ever since we worked finding your old man's killer in Indiana, I know I can trust you. But you have to trust me, man. Oh, just to wipe everything clean and get Sabota off. Right. Look, this involves Boston. Jones tilted his head. Boston? Coco produced a quick smile and then inhaled. Yeah, and I don't know why. The big boy, somebody's trying to say I paid Gina money to be with the kid. And as God is my judge, I never paid her. She made enough from what she did. But somebody paid her and they used one of my cards from the club. How does this involve Boston? Happened on the night, let's just say, uh, somebody real important was at the club. Time perfect, because I was in New York. You're saying you were set up, too. Somebody thought this thing through real good, Jonesy. Kill two birds with one stone. Get rid of me, get rid of the kid. Why would somebody bring Joe into this? No, no, Jonesy. Somebody went to Boston and they cut a deal for themselves. A deal that would squeeze me out. They must have met with some middleman scumbag. Wasn't one of the top boys. Come on. You get rid of me and you get the club. And all the, uh, how should I say, uh, associated business? Why not just go to the cops? Coco gave him a sickening look and put out the cigarette. Come on, Jonesy, I know you're not that naive. Cops would use the phony evidence against the kid. They don't care, and they'd put me away for 20. You mean Bosco? No, Kip is harmless. If you pay him and I pay him well, I'm talking about your buddy Lane. Buddy? You know what I mean. He said as he walked up to one of the monitors. Who the hell is that? Jones followed him to the end monitors. He did not see Travis, but Daniels paced in the apartment. Jones opened his eyes wide and grit his teeth. That stupid moron. I recognize him. He's the little dipshit that lived below Gina's apartment at Covington. Daniels. Coco pushed a button near the last monitor. Coco, said Rath in another room. This dude wants to see you. Wrath, kick his ass out of there and tell him I'm in Chicago. Give him Rudy Menske's address in Chicago. This man is a mental midget. Should I get my 44? No, no, don't shoot him. Just scare him. Make sure he buys the Chicago thing. Coco turned from the intercom. That little bastard is a meddler. Well, you got that right. How do I find out about Boston? Coco's eyes opened wide and he paused before he spoke. Jonesy, you're not listening to me. These people will waste you, okay? And how do I get Lane to drop the charges against Sabota? Coco rubbed his lip over his teeth. We'll attack that from another angle. I'll get the kid off. Don't worry. The intercom buzz. Coco. What is it, Wrath? When I drew my gun, this guy, Daniels, called me a bluffer. Let me get rid of him. Jones rolled his eyes and then pinched the bridge of his nose. Look you just slip little Lord Fauntleroy a Mickey and put him in that oversized Ford of his. It's an Etzel. Then drive him out of state to Madame Mowry's cat house in Vermont. You sure? Just do it, Rath. A smile came to Jones's face when he thought of Daniels waking up in a brothel. Jones watched him plop Daniels on the couch. They said something about Chicago. Then they gave him a drink. Half a minute later, he had fallen asleep on the couch. They lifted him up by the hands and legs and headed out the door. Coco turned to Jones. He put his hand on Jones's shoulder. You know I always come through, Jonesy. I'll either have people pressure Lane or I'll find out what the hell happened. But I'll tell you one thing. I ain't going down. And Daniels will wake up. Little Lord Fauntleroy will wake up with Chickadee. Chickadee? Yeah. Chickadee used to be in the roller derby. She weighs in at 265, and she's very kinky.